Good afternoon. We are here today with Professor Neil Ferguson, Director of JIDA, talking about the current coronavirus outbreak. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Would you be able to give us an update on the current estimates that you're working on with your team? So the main things we're working on currently are trying to get a better handle on really how lethal this virus is, what threat it poses to the human population. It's a difficult thing to do in an epidemic because just simply looking at how many people have died so far versus how many cases there are tells you very little. Um, it takes quite a long time often for somebody be from being diagnosed as a case mm -hmm. to actually wo whether we know they're going to live or, or survive the infection. And so we're trying to correct for those factors. In terms of looking at the overall scale of the epidemic, uh, we're getting kind of firmer estimates. Um, what we can say is the surveillance on, on ongoing in China is probably picking up, if you think of all infections out there being a kind of pyramid, it picks up the top of the pyramid, the most severe infection. We think probably 10% or less of all infections in China are being detected at the current time. The next tier down is really what's being detected overseas. We, there we think sensitivity is, is somewhat higher, but still we may be only detecting maybe a quarter of all infections at that level. Um, lots of people will be entering that the borders are porous. Countries won't be detecting every case coming in. Right. Would you be able to say anything about forward projections of where the outbreak, current outbreak is going? Well, in terms of where we think the current outbreak has got to in terms of scale, we estimate that maybe up to you know, 50,000 new infections a day occurring in China, which is obviously much larger than the official case numbers. So I mean, it's going up all the time. So the forward projections um, depend really on the effectiveness of control measures. We think the epidemic is roughly doubling in size about every five days at the current time. It's hard to evaluate how effective controls are, but there's limited evidence of it slowing in, in China. Um, under that scenario, the epidemic would really follow a natural course, probably peak in its epicenter, Wuhan, in around a month's time. Some uncertainty around that, and then maybe a month or two later in the whole of China. The rest of the world will see epidemics at various times after that, depending on how well connected they are, have been in, in the past few weeks, how many travellers have come to them who are infected from, from China itself. As to the overall effectiveness of control measures, it's hard to evaluate. If there's a lot of community transmission going on, and we think there probably is, it will be very hard to control this epidemic in the same way as, for instance, we controlled the SARS epidemic um, some 15, 20 years ago. Would you be able to explain how the mathematical modeling that your team is doing can inform policy and uh, government response? Yeah, so um, statistical and mathematical analysis of, of epidemic data has quite a long history and it's really become quite established within the policy framework, policy making framework used, particularly in the UK, but further afield. And that's because often what we have is very noisy and limited data in early in an outbreak and we want to be able to get the most information from that possible. So advanced kind of statistical modelling and then later kind of mechanistic transmission modelling can be useful in doing that. So simple questions we try to answer is, you know, how transmissible is a new pathogen? You know, how long has it been circulating? How much are case, cases are always underestimated in every epidemic? So, uh, surveillance is never 100% perfect, so how large is the real epidemic? And then you know, critically important to how people respond is, is how severe a threat does this pose to human health? Would you be able to explain a little bit about the uncertainty ranges around the estimates that you report? So uncertainty is always high early in an epidemic, particularly of a disease we've never seen before. We don't know thing, critical things like how long it takes from when somebody's infected to when they develop symptoms, something called incubation period. We don't know how transmissible the disease is. So we try to estimate these things from quite limited data. And the limited data means that there's always uncertainty in the estimates, which we try to characterise using um, state-of-the-art statistical methods. Um, so often we will quote something like, we think every case generates 2.6 other cases on average, something called the reproduction number, but there'll be a range around that, it might vary from 
anywhere between you know 2.1 up to you know 3.3 or something, and that captures how much we know about that information, that particular parameter of interest. And then with that uncertainty range, how useful is that to inform policies and governments? So generally policymakers would like everything to be certain, um, so handling uncertainty is, is a challenge. I think the uncertainty range tells them what confidence we have in the estimate, if we have calculated it correctly. So if we, for instance, say, well, the case fatality ratio, the proportion of people who might die in an outbreak, varies, could be anywhere from one in a thousand to one in ten. That's not a terribly informative estimate. Um, if we can say precisely the estimate is, you know, one percent case fatality, one percent of people will die, it could be half a percent, it could be two percent, that's a much more useful estimate. And do you have any suggestions as to what the most efficient uh, interventions would be at the moment for either China or internationally? Unfortunately for this virus, we have limited options for interventions at the current time. Um, we have no vaccine. The vaccines are rapidly being developed, but it will take months, if not years, to develop. There's some testing of, of antiviral treatments, existing drugs being repurposed to see if they work in infections in these cases. The other measures we have to draw upon are what are called public health interventions. So identifying as many cases as possible, as early as possible in their disease and isolating them is how we manage to control, for instance, the SARS outbreak, a, a genetically quite similar virus to this new virus. Whether those measures will be effect as effective in this case remains to be seen. Um, this virus has a much wider range of, of um, severity of symptoms. Quite a lot of people being infected may just have quite mild respiratory disease, might not even seek health care for it. If those people are transmitting, um, then it will be very hard to stop transmission overall. Um, so the next few weeks will really tell us about the likelihood of control measures working. So in terms of interventions, the Chinese have been throwing everything they can at this outbreak for the last certainly two weeks. In terms of what might work, that critically depends on, on who is transmitting infection and whether the people who are responsible for most onward transmission are being identified and isolated are early enough. The Chinese are currently focusing on identifying severe cases and isolating those. It's unclear whether the mild cases left in the community, and we think that's the majority of cases, are still sustaining the outbreak or not. We'll know more in the next couple of weeks. At the moment, we can't see much evidence of the epidemic slowing down. There have been few fatalities outside mainland China. Uh, would you be able to explain why that is, why we see that difference with the, case, the fatalities that we see in China? So, looking at the severity of an epidemic, and working out how many people might eventually die from it is, is very challenging. There are delays, quite often long delays, from when somebody is diagnosed with an infection and maybe reported in the media, for instance in you know, Thailand or Japan or Hong Kong, and when we finally know what the outcome of that case is, people will, severe cases will be in intensive care maybe for weeks. We think the delay from when somebody is develops symptoms to when they might die is as long as 20 days or longer, three weeks or so. So the fact we haven't seen many deaths in travellers, we've seen two so far, cases detected outside mainland China, um, is not terribly reassuring. We wouldn't have expected to see very many so far because of those delays in the system. What we're trying to do now is account for those delays and do an accurate estimate of how lethal we think this virus is. How worried are you about this current outbreak? I mean, the outbreak is clearly of concern. It's probably the most major, we call it, emerging infectious disease event the world has seen since, at least since the pandemic of influenza in 2009 and maybe since the SARS outbreak in 2003. So we don't fully know enough to be able to estimate the full scale of, of disease burden, we call it, which will affect the human population, you know, how many people will die. But it's something that certainly governments need to prepare for urgently in terms of ramping up health system preparedness and in particular undertaking rapid research to try to develop treatments which can reduce potentially fatality in, in um, severe cases of disease. How is the work that you do funded? So the funding for the work we do here comes from a number of sources. We are very fortunate to have 
um, generous institute funding from Community Jamil to fund our work, not just on responding to outbreaks, but much broader work on how the world responds to other forms of health crises um, due to climate change and the like. We then receive a lot of uh, research funding from individual research funders and so within JIDEA we have the MRC Centre for Global Infectious Disease Analysis which has generous funding from the UK Medical Research Council. We receive a lot of funding from other funders as well. Okay. Thank you for taking the time to speak to us today. It's a pleasure. <laughs>